Today we are talking about the staff data entry uh, for NEO staff. This is for the 24-25 school year. Uh, there are not a lot of changes this year, but we will just kind of go through how to do this uh, data entry. Uh, my name is Alexandra Cookson. I am the data quality trainer with the MEDEMS support team, and uh, my primary role is to help in navigation of Synergy and NEO. If anyone on this call is new to NEO or Synergy, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to do a training with you uh, on how to navigate the resources available to you for data reporting of student, staff, and school and organization data. Great. So staff data entry, who needs to be entered? All staff who are employed by an SAU are required to be entered into NEO staff. Uh, this is still a manual data entry, so you will need to make sure that you hit every single person and update them uh, in the NEO staff module. Contractors, um, if you have a contractor who has sustained direct unsupervised access to students, uh, you will need to have them entered into NEO staff as well. Um, so you will need to get their information, uh, either an educator. Sorry, I don't know why I'm muted. Um, so you will need to get a social security number or an educator ID from staff uh, who are contractors. So you'll need to contact the um, contracting organization for that information so you can get them into NEO. Staff positions that work in regular operations, um, such as bus drivers, nurses, and psychologists also need to be entered into NEO staff. Um, so anyone who is in your school districts performing regular duties in contact with students will need to be entered. Um, so there we go. Resources have moved around a little bit for the staff data um, entry. If you are on the MEDEMS support page, you will see that we have the staff data entry and reporting tile, and that tile will have all the information that you need for entering staff into NEO staff. Uh, so we're gonna go through some guides today, including the NEO staff guides for staff field definitions, staff user manual, um, what impacts education categories, categories, and then all of the appendices we will go through as well today. So these resources are all available on this staff data entry and reporting tile, and you can find them through there. Um, if, again, if you need any help navigating those resources, please feel free to reach out to me directly. I would be happy to help you. Uh, in order to enter staff, you have to be able to get into staff. So if you do not have access to NEO or you do not have the staff module for reporting in NEO, you will need to have your superintendent submit an access request form on your behalf. And then we will get your uh, access request processed so that you can get into the system and enter and update staff information. We are only able to give, give NEO accounts to people who have active staff assignments in your SAU. So we will need you to have that information. Somebody in your SAU who has staff, who has staff um, access will need to go in and update your staff assignment so that we can process your access request. Uh, without, without an active staff assignment, we cannot grant you access. That uh, NEO access request form is available on the MEDEM support page uh, toward the middle of the page. Um, superintendents can fill it out there. So let's go through some navigation really quick. So once you're in NEO, you will click on staff. In staff, you're going to select manage staff, and then you'll have a couple options here for entering your staff. If you're adding new staff members to your SAU, staff members who have not worked in your SAU previously or who have left and come back, these this would be where, uh, where you would enter your new incoming staff members. So we're gonna get into that. It will bring you to this screen where you can search for the, ta uh, the staff member that you're looking for. If the, um, you'll have to enter their first name, last name, and date of birth. Once all that information is entered and you select search, if they come up at the bottom here um, in this test, you can see them, um, you can select edit and you'll be able to go in and revise their uh, staff information and then you'll be able to update their position. If you are not able to find the person, there is also an add new staff uh, button at the bottom where you can um, find a new staff member. If they've never been employed in a main school, this would be where you would um, most likely be finding a new staff member. Um, so if they've never been employed by a main SAUs, 
then they will not show up um, in the list. But if they've been previously employed by an SAU in Maine, they should have been entered into NEO. You should be able to find their staff um, information from previously. So the staff level information that will be will be on the next page. This will be where you'll have to enter all of this information, update any changes that are there. Uh, specifically, highest degree earned is updated on this page. The reason that it is on the staff specific page is because um, degree is specific to the staff member. It is not necessarily specific to your um, position level. So we do ask that you make sure that any information for degree is updated here. Once you have all the information entered and you do need to have a uh, social security number here uh, to get past this point or you need a uh, educator ID, this is where for those contractors, you would want to make sure that you have one or the other when you're entering them into NEO staff. Once everything's entered, select save and continue and it will bring you to the position screen. Uh, so we're going to get into the position screen a little bit later, but right now we're going to go and talk about the other mechanism that you can do to get into um, adding other staff. And that is once again back here on the staff screen, selecting manage staff, and this is the SAU search. So this is for updating returning staff members from last year to this year. Everyone rolled over as of uh, July 1 and needs to be updated for an active staff assignment for 24-25. Uh, before the reporting uh, in the uh, in October, Mike. Yep, sorry to interrupt you, Ellie. Uh, I just had one quick point because everybody always asks this one. Um, if you are doing the add new staff option for, say, a contractor or somebody, um, you will need their full social to create them in Neo. So if they're not in here at all, and you're basically you're the first person to hire them, um, you will need their full social to create the profile. Um, after that, then you can use their educator ID from the certification site to um, you know, make changes or pull them in. But if, if they don't exist at all, then we need that social. Um, otherwise, there's nothing to connect them to the certification site and it can't link to an educator ID. Um, so just a note on that one. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, thank you. Um, so and updating returning staff, you would come in to manage staff. SAU search. Once you're in the SAU search, you'll have a list of staff members for your particular SAU. So if you have multiple SAUs, you will have to go into each one. AOS is in particular, you may have multiple here. Uh, just make sure you've selected the correct SAU, and then you should be able to find any staff members who have are returning for this school year. So this particular person is a test person. We can see here that they need to be updated because they are currently listed as in progress. Um, so that means that we have to select into their staff um, assignment, their position, so that we can go in and um, update their information for the current year. We're going to do that by selecting the staff ID number. So once we select the ID number, we would come into this screen here. Something to be very careful of on this screen is the, um, the adding assignment is not the same as this test up here. So uh, if you are updating someone's existing assignment, you would not want to enter any of the information here. This is if you were adding a second assignment for this particular person. So if we're updating an assignment, we would just come up here to the selection and we would select then edit to update a previous assignment to the current year. If you're adding an assignment, that would be done down here in this bottom section. Okay. If at any point when you're doing any of this data entry, you get this notification up at the top of your screen about main schools, you would need to make sure that you contact someone in your superintendent's office and say, main schools needs to be completed before I can go in and update staff. And there would have to be, um, that would have to be submitted in, before you could go in and start updating staff further. When you're updating a staff assignment or when you're entering a new staff assignment, you want to go in order of the fields that are um, from top to bottom. So here you have this is a, this would be updating this position. So this is the position we were looking at before. Uh, you can see here once you get down to you have the start position, SAU and then position are all in all already there. Uh, that's because this is updating a staff assignment from previously. 
Years of experience is going to accrue one year automatically. You do not need to update that information. It should be all set. Uh, with the rollover, it would have incremented by one year automatically. So keep going down, uh, identify the type of employer or uh, employee, the school level, if it's a school level position, uh, particularly for EPS, you will want to make sure that you're including the school name there. Um, so just make sure that that gets updated um, or included. Uh, FTE in, uh, point zero, so that uh, you have uh, tenths uh, to update your staff FTEs. Um, so if you have multiple positions split, you can split that FT the positions, one getting 0.5 or the other getting 0.5. However, it works out in how they are act the person is actually splitting their time in different positions. And then uh, funding sources, educational category, we have resources for those. Uh, and then at the bottom here, update any contact information. Contact should always be school level or organization level email, contact, phone number. Uh, please don't use any personal contact information at this point uh, because this is a public report. All of the data that goes into the contact search can be found on our data warehouse, including staff information. Um, so please just be aware of that. Make sure that you're only putting in school and organization email and other contact information to protect the privacy of your staff members. They don't really like it when we call their personal cell phone and they didn't know we could we had that. So just kind of be aware that that can that can cause some issues. Once you have all the information in there, if you select save, it is going to continue to save as in progress, which means that it is still not updated. The only way to get it to actually save um, and be submitted as active is to select the submit button. So there is a difference in these two buttons at the bottom. Save is going to save it in progress. Submit is going to change it over to an active position. Any questions so far? All right, we will continue moving forward. So a couple of resources for when you're filling out this information, we're just going to go through some of the appendices that are available. These again are on the staff data entry and reporting page. So if you need to go and find them, they're right there uh, where you can get to them uh, pretty quickly. But all of the appendices will have information about degree, course credits uh, or course codes, endorsement mappings between NEO and MEIS. Uh, we'll go into each one here in a moment and they're not in order, which drives me a little batty, but we're going to, the way they're, they are kind of makes sense. So I apologize that we're going out of order in how they are presented here, uh, but it will kind of come together here in a moment. So when you're adding a, an assignment, you have Appendix G, which will give you information about the staff job positions. So if you're not sure what the position should be, um, our names for positions are perhaps a little bit different than the positions that you have put people in. Um, or what you have chosen to name your custodian could be very different than what we have available for putting in um, here. So just kind of be aware of that, that if you need to cross-reference the name of or the job description in your SAU with um, ours, the Appendix G would be the resource to utilize in order to make sure that they're cross-referencing correct, correctly. Um, and that's where you would put that information in uh, to position. Appendix A, once you put that position in, why we say to go in order, once you put the position in, it is going to determine the following fields that you would have to fill out. So each position is a little bit different. Appendix A, the position matrix, is going to tell you what's going to come up next for questions, depending on the position you put in. So if we put in chemical hygiene officer, as you can see here, you would be asked FTE, salary, district role. If you put in a classroom teacher, however, you would have to put in school, uh, subject, courses, grade span, all of these other ones that have a one. Uh, so that would be something to just kind of be aware of. It does vary what you're going to need for information and more pop-ups will come as you work your way down this uh, data entry. Celeste, I see you have a question. Yeah. Um, 
how come some of the positions that you guys have don't match some of the positions we have? Um, some kind of counselors, like some counselors, um, we have SEL facilitators and such. Where would I find all those? Are those just so, going to be regular classroom teachers? Because I go through this every year where the positions that we have don't seem to fall into a category with your positions. Yeah, so the best resource that we would have for that would be this Appendix G um, in determining if what would be the closest match. So each SAU is going to be different in kind of the roles that they have for specific people. Um, and so you would just want to go through and make sure that it aligns as closely as possible with the staff job position descriptors. Um, and then you would, uh, I believe this Appendix G also goes through and says the endorsements that are required for each one. So that can kind of lead you to also what position to use as well. So could I use, like, if they're an SDL teacher, could I use that they're really a general elementary O2O teacher? Could I put that in there? Um, yeah. as, long, as long as that's the closest match with what the uh, description would say, yes, I would say that. Would be accurate. So what would an yeah, SDL can... teacher facilitator be under? Yeah, I can I can weigh in here because we, we've had a lot of questions on this. Um, and so for SEL, um, right now they will go in as a counselor or rehabilitation counselor, and that will require them to have a guidance counselor endorsement at a, at a minimum. That's kind of the, the current state of things. Okay, but I can guarantee you an SEL teacher is not going to have a counselor certification. Okay. And that's Why, something. How how does that how are there requirements showing that on the DOE site that this is what that um, that job would require? Because I have some SEL teachers that are not counselor certified. Yeah, it's because um, this is a new newer emerging thing, so they kind of they need to figure out how things are mapping. So we don't have. That it's possible that that may not be where things finally settle. And uh, I believe our EPS folks and our staff collection folks are talking to the certification team to see how they need to handle this. But uh, that's where it's at right now. So yes, uh, if they don't have it, they will show in violation. Uh, once again, though, you know, I, I know you're very good about your violations list, Celeste, um, but that's Sorry. just kind of the way that, uh, that it's going to kind of show up for now. Um, that won't affect the EPS funding for Lewiston, though, will it? No, the certifications, whether they're endorsed or not, that does not affect EPS funding. It okay. does affect other things if they go when you know when they go to audit um, and see who's certified in things. Um, but obviously, they're not they're aware of the issues that are going on, and so if they see you know SEL stuff, um, and and that's and that's how we we figure these things out is we see a bunch of folks in violation. We go, OK, what's going on with this? And then we talk to you guys, find out they're, oh, they're SEL. OK, maybe we need to find a new endorsement, or maybe they shouldn't have an endorsement. That's kind of how this process kind of works. So as as you guys hire new staff and they're doing different roles, um, it's just we we have to kind of trim down the bucket because we can't have, um, you know, if you, you guys are a larger district, so you might have very, very specialized staff that, you know, a smaller district is going to have absolutely no need for. And so rather than collecting the 10,000 potential different positions, we kind of just have buckets. And that's what this is all about is just getting folks into the appropriate bucket because um, we don't need to have the nitty gritty detail um, necessarily of exactly the duties they're doing. We just need general duties. So I hope that kind of clears up some of what we're doing with staff. Okay, so another question, and I, I'm, I know you haven't gotten down to the federal funding piece yet, but a lot of the um, the Easter funds are going away, but we're still, we're, we're draining those funds till like the end of September. I believe that's when it ends. Um, if I go in and start entering these staff members now, should I be tracking those people to go back and change their funding source in October before we submit the report? Yeah, that, that would be ideal because um, when you guys certify your staff, it's going to be as of the day you certify it. So whatever the the status is as of, you know, end of October, that's what you would want to lock in. 
Um, Because if you guys are starting to pay it for those positions out of your own pocket, then we definitely want to know that. And that will potentially, um, you know, impact the funding you get. So. Okay, I think that's all I have. Thanks. Yep. So a good a good question because yeah we assigning staff is always something that comes up because yeah you you guys probably have more positions than we do but that's by design so it's not a it's not an issue per se um and we did have um i did see your your question katie about a long-term sub um we can just if you don't mind ali i'll just hit that one while we're here um so yeah long-term subs are fun they are for our NEO staff purposes, they are a one-to-one -one replacement for a classroom teacher or a special education teacher, and that's it. You can't have a long-term sub admin assistant or a long-term sub principal. Um, if it's one of those, if it's not a teaching position, um, then you just enter them as that position because that's what they're doing. And that's what NEO is here to collect is what who are the people in your buildings and you know what what duties are they performing so you know if, if you have somebody filling in as a um you know an, an ed tech or something or filling in as a teacher um and they're not credentialed as a teacher then they show in violation because they're teaching a class and they're not uh certified and it's not really the long-term sub 60 90 day thing doesn't really apply if there is no person that they are like specifically replacing that's on leave and I think that that might have been more the flavor of your question. So if you have just a straight up vacant uh, fourth grade teacher position, and you know obviously you need somebody doing that, and if you guys just have somebody that's filling in for that fourth grade teacher position, um, but your fourth grade teacher is not on leave, then they are not a long term sub for somebody. They just are the fourth grade teacher. So you would enter them as classroom teacher general fourth grade does that make sense um and that's kind of how you guys handle those lps positions so i put them in as a teacher not as a substitute right if, if they're not like a one-to-one -one replacement for you know joanne is out on maternity leave for four months and someone's filling in um if, if they're not actually specifically replacing a specific person then they're not a long-term sub they're just the position and you'll you'll see that if you go to try to enter a long term sub, literally the first question it asks is say, OK, who is this person replacing? And you've got to pick right. from a list in Neo. Right. And so if you're if your person's not in the list, then that kind of clues you in. OK, maybe they're not a maybe they're not a long term sub. Maybe they're just the position. So is there a way for us to identify for you that it is a sub? You know, like we're still advertising those positions. They, it is a vacant position. So they really are substituting. I understand you're telling me I'll put them in as a classroom teacher, but um, they're not a classroom teacher. Right. So we are, correct me, didn't, are we sending out a survey to collect vacant positions? It's Ellie? a pilot. It's, it's not. Okay. Um, yeah, we are part of that pilot program. So you're basically just identifying what your vacancies are. And then, you know, they're compiling it through the state so we can see where vacancies are. But so is there a way that you are going to know, or I guess I'm worried about us having. Um, mm. Yeah, you know, too many people on our violations list that it's not really a classroom teacher, but the only way I can identify them is as a classroom teacher. Right. They can they can go in as a substitute teacher also. Um, That's but true. If you wanted to indicate um, it that way, you could. Um, but if if you're so if you're concerned about your violations list, they can go in as a substitute teacher and they're there as a sub. Thank um, you. Yeah. I didn't know how that worked hand in hand with like EPS and all of that though, because these are EPS positions. All right. Uh, that's that's where it does get a bit tricky. And I would say, yeah, entering them as just a regular substitute will probably do what we need, so we can see the see the see the vacancies and then you know adjust the the funding accordingly for that. 
Lori, did you have a question? Yes. Uh, we have contracted nurses. Now, we come up as a violation with those contracted nurses because they don't carry the 520 endorsement. How would that work? Should we be putting them in as nurses contracted? Yep. Yeah, is it because they don't have, um, do you guys not have their license numbers to we, enter we into Neo staff? We have their license number. We have their license number, but we do not have their endorsement. They are CHRC, but they don't have the nursing endorsement. Gotcha. Are they like um, are they like hospital employees that you guys are kind of having come in? I know that was a thing people had. Uh, not um, not specifically. They might be helping out um, our nurses that we do have in the system, but they're extra. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean that's kind of what um, that's kind of why the system's here, right? Um, so I know it's uh, <laughs> that doesn't look great, but yeah, if they're I mean, if you guys have them in doing school nurse duties and they don't have the nursing endorsement, then cool. They just, that's how it is. It's, it's how it looks. And then the people that uh, look into that stuff and make decisions about it, you know, their job will probably come up to talk to you and say, hey, what's going on with these folks? And then you explain the situation and then they can kind of advise or they um, can help adjust policies as needed. So, um, yeah. I would just enter them in. Like I said, I, I wouldn't worry too much about the violations, guys. Um, it's kind of, it's the mechanism for changing policy and decision making. So if everything just looked perfect completely all the time, then nothing would ever change. We'd go, okay, great. Everything's perfect. We don't need to do anything. So by, you know, you guys recording your situations like this, um, it allows them to see what's happening. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it. And like I said, the, the endorsements don't affect funding. It's not going to reduce your EPS or anything. So. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Jill? Yeah, I had a follow up question on the position part with substitutes. And if we have um, substitutes in covering for teachers, and you said put them in as a um, substitute teacher, but then uh, they don't have the, the all of the qualifications to substitute. Um, indefinitely in a in a grade level position so they'll show up on the violation report is that does that sound right but that's the way we have to do it so right yeah for for a substitute teacher they need a chrc and right. i think that's it um so it wouldn't show up on the violation report because that would if as long as they have that they're all set um, it and they wouldn't it wouldn't track to them subbing in fourth grade, for example. Um, so they wouldn't be mapped to an O2O or an equivalent. Right, but it does show like in your appendix G that they can only sub for so long if they only have this much schooling and and stuff like that. So that's just basically for us to keep track of. Is that accurate? It it, and it's if they're have, subbing uh, in the same classroom. So yeah, it's something that you would need to keep track of because it that's subbing. You could have someone sub every single day, um, but as long but if they're subbing in a different classroom every day, that's different than if they're actually teaching a class. Like they're actually the long term sub. Um, right. In that situation, you would need to keep track of it, and you would need to mark that ninety days um, for that teacher, so that yeah. you can make sure that you're getting on top of their certification. And what if we have ed techs uh, threes that we are um, temporarily using till we have special ed teachers um, hired? Do we label them as the ed tech three? Because that's how we're keeping them as our payroll is concerned. Um, and then just show that the special, like, because those special ed teacher positions are still open and still being, um, you know, put out there for job openings and advertised so just keep them as an ed tech three yeah. yeah keep them as the ed tech three um and keep the open position for your special ed teacher okay celeste what does affect the eps funding and all of this like what are your specifics that are going to Oh, that is a really great question. Donna, would you like to take that question? Uh, 
Sorry, I couldn't find my unmute button. It's um, okay. The the um, things that affect the EPS are more the highest degree earned and number of years served, and then what position they held, hold. Does that answer the question or? The less does that answer your question? So it's the highest degree that they have, the years of service that their person is employed or been in that position, even if they come from another district and the position that they hold. Yeah, so whether they're a teacher or an ed tech, um, they also have to be assigned a building for EPS. Okay. And for um, principals, they, we also look at the size of the school. Okay. All right, so when you guys are reviewing your staff listings, if you have um, central office staff um, that aren't assigned to a school building, then they will show EPS no, and that's by design. Okay, thanks. All right, the, those positions, mm -hmm. the um, non-school um, assigned positions are part of EPS, but they're down below. They're not a individual count. They're part of a um, funding that's for administrators, which is on page one, but it's part D. Where is that one again? Yeah, Donna's referring to your uh, ED 279s. Yes. ED 279's page one part D is where you receive funding towards, um, you receive a calculation towards allocation. Okay, thanks. All right, we're gonna continue moving forward here. Um, so again, uh, staff uh, appendix G staff job uh, position descriptions. If you need help matching any of your positions with positions that we have listed here at the state, um, appendix A is going to tell you what will pop up later. Uh, the appendices are located on the staff uh, data entry, so right here. So on the Medem support page, staff data entry and reporting, all of them were listed at the bottom section of all of the drop downs. So you have all of those resources there. Um, a lot of them, uh, a couple of them download into a um, Excel file or a Word document. Uh, and then some of them will drop down and you'll just have to scroll through uh, the information there. So as you can see, so I just wanted to illustrate the difference between two positions for Appendix A. You can see here there are more questions for uh, someone who is entered as a coach versus someone who is entered as a chemical hygiene officer. So you can see one of the uh, main questions is going to be this, the level of the position. So is it district or school level? So you can see there's a slight difference here in these two positions. Appendix A, once again, will give you the information about what you need to have before you start entering a staff member. Um, so I would recommend going to the Appendix A, gathering all your materials, and then going into NEO and starting to do your data entry once you have everything gathered. Again, it's very different if you're adding a classroom teacher compared to a uh, chemical hygiene officer or a uh, bus driver. So you'll need a lot more information for those people, including their course information, uh, where what you enter at your subject matter is going to impact what comes up in the section below for options to choose. Um, in terms of cons of looking at endorsements and that tracking of violations from MEIS to NEO, um, this would be Appendix H would be a great resource in making sure that you're entering staff into positions that they are eligible to be teachers in. Um, so you can see here for this particular um, staff member, if you're putting in for fourth grade, uh, you would want to make sure that you're choosing an endorsement that matches with theirs. For example, I have an O2O, and uh, with that O2O, I can teach grade four under non-subject specific, but if you put me under fine arts, 
uh, and you put me in as art grade four, that would come up in violation because I don't have a 620. Um, so those types of things, just kind of be aware that how you're putting the information into this part uh, in that Appendix H will help you map all of the NEO courses with the MEIS endorsement so you can make sure that your staff are um, accurate and valid. Appendix D, this is that uh, the course guides. So a lot of times what happens in a school is you have your course catalog and you send out your course catalog to your um, students. That course catalog may not match one to one with what is reported at the state level. So this resource can be used to go through and cross reference the description of the SCED code with your, cat your course catalog to identify what would be the best fit for your uh, for your staff. So a lot of times what I'll recommend here, because uh, this can be kind of this can be kind of be a big job, uh, but you can also um, send this back to like your team leads at your schools and say, you know, this course has been created, let's map it to the SCED code. Um, so that can be something that you would do as well. Appendix B will list out your federally funded programs and descriptions. Um, so this will just give you all the information. If you were to uh, choose one of these funding sources, what it means in terms of where the funding would be coming from. So uh, all those descriptions are in Appendix B. Appendix C will go through all of the highest degree earned. So this again is updated on the staff specific page. So you have to access them through staff, uh, staff search. Um, you can update to bachelor's degree, bachelor's plus 15, uh, any up to uh, doctorate or other. Uh, when you're doing this, again, you will have to go to the staff search. Uh, you will have to search for the staff member, edit their staff assignment, and then you will at the bottom of that section have the opportunity to update highest degree earned. There are a couple places where you can go through and you can see what your staff members have for current highest degree earned and we'll go through those reports next. So when you're looking at your staff module under reports, you have staff details report and the staff details report for courses and FTE. So you can see here what staff are teaching, uh, what grades they're teaching. You can see their FTEs. Uh, this would also be the place where you could find someone's highest degree earned. If you were concerned that something hadn't been updated, you could pull this report to identify any staff who need to go in and have their highest degree earned updated. So these reports can be really useful when you're validating your reports for October. I would highly recommend uh, finding these um, and exporting them. Uh, just keep in mind, if you do export them, they do not get updated um, from any changes that are made in NEO. So once they're exported, they're an independent file. Uh, you'll have to re-download the file if you update information in NEO staff. Randy, I see you have a question. Yes, thank you. Um, regarding the bias degree design, I noticed there wasn't an association with that. Randy, could you type your question in the chat? I'm having a hard time hearing you today. I'm just gonna, okay, um, regarding the highest degree earned. Um, if, they're, if they don't have a, um, let me go back to it. So highest degree earned for staff, um, this is based, this is primarily for like um, EPS positions uh, and those would, those usually require some level of, um, like a bachelor's, they usually don't go down to an associate's degree. Um, so that's why we don't have associates in there. Um, I don't, Mike, could they put in other for that or would that be different? Yeah, they would just put them under other. That's what I thought. So, okay. yeah. Perfect. All right. 
go back to the reports and then uh, the other other reports that you would have to look at here under staff would be staff with multiple positions, staff with EPS positions. Um, so you can see the descriptions in Appendix F of these EPS reports and how you would find them on your ED-279. Um, so all of that information is available in Appendix F. And lastly, for a, a EPS position matrix, this is going to go through the EPS eligible positions for staff members. So this would be like what we were talking about earlier in going through and talking about um, classroom teacher. You need to make sure it's at a school level. Um, so what would be eligible for funding? Donna, do you want to talk any more uh, about this resource? No, that's that's I just shared the link with that to Perfect. this with the group. Perfect. All right. And then we have a new resource available. Um, I don't know where we are with getting it launched yet. It is coming soon, as far as I know. Uh, it is in the works to be published very soon. Um, the NEO user accounts report is a superintendent access report. So superintendents will be able to go in and see this one. Uh, they can go in and see who has NEO user accounts. Uh, most of them at this time are going to say created by the system just because this is a new report. If you if we uh, have someone since this report has gone live, it will say the name of the person from the Medem support team who created the account for that person. Uh, and you can see the created date. Most of them, again, are going to be uh, 1 1 1900, but that is just because it's new. Uh, if they're since the update, you will see the actual date that was they were created. So if there are individuals on this report that you're seeing have access and they have not been at your SAU for a while, I was looking at one the other day and I was like, oh, I know that person is no longer there. Um, so you would just want to go in and check it out, make sure you have um, the correct people who have access to NEO in your system. Um, when you end an assignment in NEO, if the person had access to NEO, it's not connected. The two things are independent from one another. So you have to contact medems.support to have accounts deactivated uh, for special ed directors, uh, data specialists, uh, nutrition directors, anybody that has access to NEO, you'll want to review this regularly if you have them going in and out. Um, Mike, do you know when this report is going live? Um, we actually have it live. We have access to it, and there's an issue. Um, Superintendent is supposed to be able to see this right now, but they cannot. So hopefully we have that up and running uh, pretty soon. It is in the works so, currently. It yeah. is superintendent access. So this is going to be um, only divvied out to superintendents at this time. So you would need to get the report from them. Um, so just be aware of that as well. Jill? This, when the superintendent looks at the report, it's only people that would have access for our particular school district. She wouldn't like, so if they left our school district and they're at another one that has access, it wouldn't show up for us unless they still had, unless we didn't right. deactivate it for us. Correct. Okay. So this is specific to your SAU and any individuals who have access to your SAU's data. Um, so okay. this is anyone who has access to staff, nutrition, um, student data in your with your particular SAU listed. Uh, usually when somebody goes to another SAU, they have to reapply for access, and that's usually under a different email address because it's based on their school email that we get. So. Yeah, so the idea with this is, um, you know, the superintendent can download the list, um, you know, perhaps pass it off to an HR person or something and have them say, you know, how many of these folks are still around? Um, and then, you know, you guys working with it in Excel or something can just flag them as red or something like that. And then they can email it over to our um, support box and then we can just run through deactivate the ones you guys um, need deactivated so that's the the idea of it i know some of you right now are really good about it and you'll um, email us asking for the list and we were able to pull it but we thought it would be great if you guys could just have access to it and uh be a little more proactive so um yeah that's the uh, the design we don't have one for super and for uh, synergy yet 
Um, so if you do, or if you have concerns about that, do reach out and ask for that access. Um, so as a, as a non-superintendent, you can let us know who needs to be removed. Um, if, but right now, superintendents are the only ones who have access to this once it goes live. Uh, it's still in the works. We're still working on some glitches. Um, so they will have access to it. They can export it so that you can use it. And the way Mike was just talking about, mark anybody who needs to be taken off. And then you can send that, anybody can send that to us and say, this is who needs to be removed. Yeah. And any time that, you know, somebody leaves, you know, if you're an HR or an admin or something, yeah, if you just want, need somebody's access removed, we'll never question that, you know, we'll try to work with you as quickly as we can. So, yep. Yeah. All right. With that, uh, are there any last minute questions? And if there are any questions after today's webinar um, or about the enter, entering staff, you start getting into it, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to contact metams.support at main.gov um, or visit our website. Uh, we are metams support, so make sure that you're looking for that on your uh, on the DOE page, um, and we can get you the answers you need, or you can call 624-6896. Jill, I see you have a question. Yeah, sorry. I'm still just learning all this. Um, I think I've asked this in the past at other places, but um, looking at uh, coaches, athletic coaches, and um, if we just certify in the fall of October, it's really only going to show our fall coaches unless we have some of our winter coaches already hired by then. So is that going to be an issue? Not in terms of EPS, coaches are not in the EPS formula. So no, right. that would not that would not impact. The reason that you're putting your coaches in is primarily to cross-reference to MEIS and ensure that they are certified with a CHRC. Right. And then, so putting in years of experience wouldn't really matter either because, like, if I end date them and then put them back in, I lose their years of experience from year to year. So that doesn't really matter either. Yeah, and again, they're not in EPS position, so. Right. Um, okay. And yeah, well, they they won't um, for the the years of experience. Like you're not, they they don't lose their years of experience. Um, like as coaching, it just means that you know you ended their assignment and now it can no longer roll over. But like, if you had a coach right now that had five years of experience and you end their assignment and then they come back in the spring, um, you re-enter their assignment, you would still put them that they have five years of experience. So that that doesn't change. But the, right. I think the the crux of your question is like, so the purpose of the staff certification is for you guys to kind of verify a list of staff so that we can process and well, I should say Donna's team can process uh, the EPS calculations and they need to get moving on that right after um, like right in you know November. So the whole point of the certification is just you guys saying, OK, we are good with these numbers for you guys to proceed with your calculations. So the point is not to capture every single staff that you have throughout the entire year. That's not what the staff certification is doing. It's just trying to lock in a list that they can work with. And so basically I would advise, you know, just wait until some point in October when you guys are good and then just certify it. And then if somebody starts, you know, two days after you certified it, uh, you're welcome to decertify the data, add the person, recertify it if you want. Um, but like if you guys certify it on the 30th, you lock it in, somebody starts on November 5th, um, you basically, you, it's, it's not really that important that they get tracked and you staff is going to be locked after you certify it. And then while they're doing the calculations and then it'll open back up, uh, I believe December 1st, and then you can start adding people. Um, and that's, that's the design of what we're doing here. So yeah, it's, it's not, to not to have everybody, it's just for you guys to give us a, a reasonably stable list um, for the end of October of whoever's there at that time. Who else? So, so we, oh, I'm sorry, okay. we have until the end of October. So your question again, Jill? Or, yeah, yeah sorry. We have the end until uh, the end of October to certify? Or is so, it yes. 
So the the report, so the staff certification report for EPS is due on the 30th of October. We didn't talk about that today just because that is a very specific report um, and we will talk about it. I believe we have it scheduled to be on 10-1. We'll be talking about the specific staff certification report, uh, but staff can be an updated and entered at any time. So wouldn't it affect our EPS funding if we have staff that start after we send the report on October 30th and we fill um, a couple of great level classes, isn't that going to affect our EPS funding if they're late hires? So I'm going to I'm going to let Donna take that one because I'm pretty sure it's something to do with rates. So I'm just going to let her take that one uh, to talk about how it impacts funding. What we look for with funding for EPS is a snapshot of data at a point in time for the staff that you have at your school and the way the calculation is run. It's based on the percent of um, FTE that EPS will cover based on the number of students and um, ratios that are in statute for EPS funding. So not having them in is not necessarily going to hurt you. Um, hurt you. In fact, putting somebody in that's not there would hurt you more than not having somebody that may start on October second. Okay. I try and get them in as quick as I can, so it helps a little bit more. But. Okay, thanks. There was a question in the chat about contact information. If you're interested in going through some neo navigation, um, my contact information is alexandra.cookson at main.gov. Um, and if you want to give me a call, it's um, 207-446. 3897. I put that in the chat also. If anybody wants to snag that before you lose access to the chat, please feel free. Um, if anyone has any other questions, uh, we'll give it just a moment here. Um, if you have questions after that, please feel free to give us a call. Our slides are not going to be available, but we will be posting this recording on our DOE data uh, playlist for YouTube, so you can have access to that resource once uh, we are done today. And so hopefully that will be up. Um, I'm hoping it will be by the uh, by the end of the day today. Again, Mike just put in the chat, we're doing a full webinar and staff certification on 10-1 uh, and you, it will be due on 10-30. If there are no questions, I think we can and today's call.